<clears throat> okay, let's begin with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful for this morning. And um, we are thankful for all the things that uh, have been happening, even though they're difficult. We know, Lord, that you have foreseen everything. And so we trust in you that you will work things out to your purposes and that they will be a blessing to us as we follow and serve you. Uh, we pray, Lord, that as we continue our studies in Ezekiel, that your Holy Spirit can be here and that you can help us to understand the things we study. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Um, now I'm going to, okay, let's share my screen here. Now in looking at Ezekiel chapter 30, so we had yesterday, we kind of reviewed a little bit from 24 to 29 and into 30. And one of the things we know um, in this part dealing with Egypt is that um, there are these, uh, it's during the time that Nebuchadnezzar, uh, the 70 years, so it's the days of one king, and he's typifying the United States. And it's during that time that we see uh, these prophecies regarding Egypt. And Egypt represents the UN. That's the conclusion that we have. And we, we've tried to understand uh, how we are applying these things in our time. And, and for me, I see that all of these things are connected with the Sunday law, right from Ezekiel uh, chapter 24 all the way uh, through, through 32, that this is dealing with the threefold union, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, and them coming together at the Sunday law. And it leads further through uh, to events that happen with the second coming and also after the thousand years. So we've had the symbolism uh, relating to that period of time. So it's, it's not dealing with a specific day or in a specific event, all of these prophecies are dealing with that whole period of time. E Edom, Moab, and Ammon uh, is uh, where you have the people that escape from the hand of the papacy. Uh, that's dealt with in the symbols of the Protestants and, and also um, uh, the, the Phil Philistines symbolize something, which I'm not sure that may symbolize people who aren't Protestants. Um, we also have Tyre, which is the papacy, and, uh, and then Nebuchadnezzar is given Egypt as wages for his labor for the siege, 13-year siege that he um, had against Tyre. And so when we go into the study of Egypt, we're dealing and addressing that, that issue of how Nebuchadnezzar is given Egypt. So we're going to look at uh, chapter 30, verse uh, 20 to 26. And probably we can get through these verses today. Um, I'll read over these verses. We're going to be looking at some other passages of scripture that relate to it. Um, now, as far as the chronology of this, uh, this ends up being uh, three months after um, uh, Ezekiel 29, verse 1, which is January 26, 586, and this is April 20th, 586. So it's about three months before uh, the fall of Jerusalem. Um, more specifically, it's, uh, I think, 89 days, if I'm not mistaken something like that, uh, before the fall of Jerusalem, 89 or 88 days. <clears throat> and it came to pass in the 11th year, in the first month, in the seventh day of the month, that the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, I have broken the arm of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and lo, it shall not be bound up to be healed, to put a roller to bind it, to make it strong to hold the sword. 
Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and will break his arms, the strong, and that which was broken. And I will cause the sword to fall out of his hand. And I will scatter the Egyptians among the nations and will disperse them through the countries. And I will strengthen the arms of the king of Babylon and put my sword in his hand. But I will break Pharaoh's arms and he shall groan before him with the groanings of a deadly wounded man. But I will strengthen the arms of the king of Babylon and the arms of Pharaoh shall fall down. and They shall know that I am the Lord when I shall put my sword into the hand of the king of Babylon and he shall stretch it out upon the land of Egypt. And I will scatter the Egyptians among the nations and disperse them among the countries, and they shall know that I am the Lord. So here again, we have this um, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, he's going to be given uh, Egypt as, as the way, as wages for the siege of Tyre. Now, just to go back, um, to chapter 29, it's uh, this prophecy about the wages isn't given until, because um, this is in verse 28. So Ezekiel 29, 18, I mean, son of man, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, caused his army to serve a great service against Tyrus. Every head was made bald and every shoulder peeled, yet he had no wages nor his army for Tyre for the service that he had serviced against it. Therefore, thus said the Lord God, behold, I will give the land of Egypt unto Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and he shall take her multitude and take her spoil and take her prey, and it shall be the wages for his army. I've given him the land of Egypt for his labor, wherewith he served against it, because they wrought for me, said the Lord God. So we know that this. This prophecy here is in the 27th year of, of the captivity, uh, the first month, the first day of the month. So what is it has this symbol of the first day of the first month, which is very interesting. And um, it being in the 27th year, that puts it uh, about two and a half years after Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 40. So this prophecy is inserted here, even though it's actually the last prophecy given to Ezekiel. It's, it's not the last prophecy listed in the book of Ezekiel. That's the one dealing with the 10th day of the seventh month. Um, but this prophecy here is inserted in these prophecies regarding Egypt. And when you have this uh, prophecy given, uh, when this date here in Ezekiel uh, puts it in uh, 570 BC in the spring, as as we know, that one ends up being um, April 26th, 570 BC, and in in placing this prophecy here instead of at the end of the book, there there are some interesting things that come from that. And I, I don't know how to say it yet. I, 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 we're gonna get to some of these things later on. Uh, but the point is, it's, it's placed here in this context. And I don't know why God gave it to him after that. Now we do know that uh, the siege of Tyre ended in 572. So this is about two years after the siege of Tyre. and um, you know, so it was 572 or 573. Um, so it's, it's then that God gives this prophecy. And my position is that um, this prophecy is marking the time when the 40 years begin, because it's talking earlier about these 40 years. And so Ezekiel 29, 18 is, or verse 17 to uh, 29 verse 17 to 21 is placed here because of this prophecy of the 40 years. So that's my position, whether that's correct or not. I, I don't know how to prove it other than that you can connect 40 years later uh, with Cambyses and him taking over Egypt. 
um, which is actually a benefit to Egypt. It's not, it's not a, a bad thing for Egypt. So, so that's, you know, we've, we've gone over that, but this point needs to be, you know, made very clear of, of first of what, how we're interpreting this, but then again, uh, also our uncertainty about some of these things. So we, we need to keep that in mind as well. Now we also have, um, we have Nebuchadnezzar that we've taken to understand that Nebuchadnezzar here is symbolizing the United States. That is the days of one king. During this period of time, he is uh, dominating the Middle East, and there's 70 years for Babylon, and they end with the death of um, Belshazzar on October 13, 539 BC. So, so we have a bunch of symbols here um, related to uh, these, these different kingdoms. We have the days of one king, the 70 years, uh, the symbol of October 13. At the end of that, um, we have them symbolizing the United States. That was something that was very clear uh, that we have understood in this message. And then we have Egypt, and Egypt symbolizes the world. And uh, Egypt is going to have Babylon come against it. And we're going to see this as we look uh, in more detail at chapter 30, uh, verse 8, 20, and on. So, so when we jump back here to where we started, Ezekiel 30, verse 20, about three months before the fall of Jerusalem and three months after uh, Ezekiel 29, where he's talking about Egypt, we're going to see that the arm of the arm of the Pharaoh king of Egypt is going to be broken. And um, some people have pointed out the significance of this broken arm in that if you look at many of the statues of the Pharaoh, um, he likes to show off his biceps. And, and the reason that he does this is the arm is a symbol of the army and the power of Pharaoh. And so it's very fitting that. Uh, Ezekiel uses this prophecy regarding, regarding the breaking of the arms of Pharaoh. But also there's going to be the strengthening of the arms of the king of Babylon. So, so we've got this background here, um, and we're going to look at it in more detail. But how, how would we understand the strengthening of the arms of the king of Babylon in our time and the breaking of the arms of Pharaoh in our time? Could we apply that in some way um, in, in how we've understood things already? So I'm not asking for some new interpretation of our line, but how would we have applied that if we had applied, applied it um, in our time based on what we, we've already understood? I, I don't know if that question is a very good question, because if I ask it too directly, everybody will know what I'm talking about. When is, if, if Babylon represents the United States and Egypt represents the UN, let's put it that way, can we see an application of these passages in the way that we already understand? Them? I don't know that the application is exactly completely clear yet. Okay, well, what have we said about the United States and the UN? In our time, what what is it that we expect? We expect that the UN is going to take control of the of the United States. Okay, so we we say that the UN is going to take control of the United States, or do we say the United States takes control of the UN? No, it, it would be the other way around. So you think it's the other way around? Yes, I do. Um, so if we're saying that Trump's going to be the head of the UN. Would that be the UN controlling the United States or the United States controlling the UN? Well, it, the way that I've always looked at it, the way that I've, I've come to understand it was that the UN would be the one that would be appointing those that would be in control in different areas of the world. And 
that the United States would surrender its sovereignty. Now, Trump is not a person that, that would look to su surrender the U.S. sovereignty, but I can think of others that would. Yeah, okay. Now, the way that I understood it is that Trump would become the head of the U.N., and, and the only reason why he would do that, even though he's fought against the globalists, is that he would do that um, for the very fact that it's the United States that's in control and, and that he believes that the United States plans could be um, implemented by having that control of the UN. So uh, the way I understood it, maybe I understood it wrong, but that I saw the United States uh, usurping the UN, while at the same time, the Pope really is ultimately in control. So that you have um, the 10 kings, they, uh, they don't have any kingdom as yet, as yet but they will uh, have the kings one hour with the beast, right? So this is Revelation chapter 17. Um, Yeah, let's see. Um, twelve. What's that? Twelve. First twelve. 12. 12. Yeah, the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but received power as kings, one hour with the beast. So this is the United Nations that be that's being talked about. Now, in, in this, in, in Revelation 17, because we know Revelation 17 is sister chapters uh, or, or, or visions, parallel visions that have similarities but differences with chapter of the beast in chapter 12 and the beast in chapter 13. Um, so one is in chapter 12, we see it as a great red dragon, and, and this represents pagan Rome even though primarily it's a symbol of Satan. And in, in chapter 13, uh, we see this composite beast. And, um, and one of the things you look at is you look at these, these horns with the crowns. So for instance, if you go to chapter 12, and um, uh, he has seven heads, 10 horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. So uh, the crowns are not upon the horns, they're upon the heads, and there's seven of them. In chapter 13, um, it has uh, seven heads and 10 horns, and his horns, 10 crowns. So you have 10 crowns upon the 10 horns. And then in chapter 17, we see uh, that there are no crowns on the horns. Uh, but the ten horns which thou saw, sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast. So how would we understand this, dif this main difference here, or this particular difference here, between the beast of Revelation 12, which is pagan, pagan Rome, or the beast of Revelation 13, which is papal Rome, and the beast of Revelation 17, which is uh, modern. How, how would we see the difference of these crowns? What, what would they mean? Well, the, the way that to address part of the question is, is this not a progression? Because you're dealing with, as you just said, pagan, papal, and then modern. Right. So, the big difference is that the modern would have learned to be more surreptitious than the the prior two car incarnations of of Rome. Okay. Now, so you know, it's very clear that when we look at the seven crowns, why are they on the seven heads and not on the ten horns? In, in Revelation 12. 
well, the head aren't aren't the heads denoting um, more a people? Hmm. Okay, you know, one of the things we see that this 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 occurs at the time of Christ that we see this vision, right? This great uh, there's there's a great wonder in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, upon her head, a crown of 12 stars. And she being with child, cried, travailing in birth, pain to be delivered. And this is, of course, the woman symbolizes the church, which is, at that time, Israel. And um, all these symbols, they have a lot of significance. Uh, but we know that uh, this birth of this child is the promised seed that's coming that's promised from Revelation chapter 3. And, and this seed of a woman is going to bruise the serpent's head. And so now what we see is we see this serpent arise, which is primarily Satan, but also applies to pagan Rome. And so this great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns. So there are seven heads and, and ten horns. So what are the heads? How would we understand the seven heads of the great red dragon, which primarily is Satan, but secondarily represents pagan Rome? I'm not sure if everybody knows how the pioneers understood this. Okay. Because they saw because they saw this as a symbol of the government of Rome. Seven heads or seven mountains. Yes. Well, there's seven mountains later on here that doesn't say that there's seven mountains. Yes, but you can, you can connect it to 17 verse 9. Yes, and, and in the seven mountains, uh, that would have been understood by the pioneers as the seven hills of Rome. Correct? I think so, yes. Yeah, but when they looked at Revelation 12 and they looked at these seven heads and ten horns, they saw this having to do with the government of, of Rome, of pagan Rome. That's, that's the way they looked at it. So, so in applying these symbols, um, these, uh, these crowns or these seven heads have to do with the division of the government, um, the way that the, the Rome was divided. Um, and these 10 horns have to do with the different, um, I can't remember the word, for it, I could probably find it. I don't know what Uriah Smith said about it. I can look that up. But, okay, but when, when you're dealing with the with the number seven in this regard, yeah. If, if we go back to the 1843 chart, you also have the of the of the ten nations. You have three of them that are plucked up, and but seven others yet remain. Yes, except that. This is dealing with pagan Rome, not dealing with papal Rome. And uh, what's plucked up are not the the heads, but three of the uh, set of three of the horns, right? So I don't think that there's a relationship between uh, the seven heads here and the seven that remain. But but that's just my my view on it. But as far as understanding what they understood, um. Uh, we'll see what if Shirai Smith says the same thing. As what, the pioneer. Instead, instead of Smith, when you're looking for something from the pioneers, why are we not referring to Miller? Uh, just because I happen to have Smith's stuff here in my eSort. Okay. I was just seeing if he says the same thing as the pioneers, and he doesn't appear to. Um, but in the pioneers, they, they, they show that these are the divisions of the Roman government. That's the way they looked at the seven heads and ten horns and, and these seven crowns upon the seven heads. So um, now it could be that this would refer to something else. Uh, I, I'm just saying how they understood it was that this had to do with the divisions of the Roman government. And, that, and I can't just remember the, the names that they used for the divisions of the Roman government. But what we have done generally as some bad is we've just just like we did with the 1260, is we just see a beast with seven heads and 10 horns and we just think it's the same thing. Most Adventists just wouldn't even make the distinction. 
uh, between th this, these different beasts. One is both the time period and then the function of these beasts, what, what it is they're doing, what their actions are. Um, but God keeps using these similar symbols uh, for different periods of time because of the connection between these governments, right? So we know that this is all a continuation of Rome, and Rome is the final kingdom of Bible prophecy. So we're probably not going to settle this one right now, but that's the main point I wanted to make. And I, I think there is actually another application of Revelation chapter 12 that horns and the heads, uh, especially if we're trying to apply it to our time. But in chapter 13, um, we're going to see that this is definitely referring to the period near the end of um, the pag pagan Rome entering into papal Rome, right? Because these, these 10 horns are representing the 10 kingdoms. So you have seven heads, 10 horns, but the 10 crowns are from these 10 horns. So it's marking a change from pagan Rome to papal Rome. And then it's also going to do that change. It's going to deal with the whole period of the papacy. And then it's going to show the rise of the United States. Right. So that's going to be the second beast. And in, in chapter 13, it's not dealing with just a single point in time. It's actually covering a, quite a long period of time, all the way from the beginning of papal Rome to, uh, to the Sunday law. Right, that's the period of time that's going to be cover, covered in, in Revelation 13. And we also see in Revelation 13, lots of parallels with Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45. So we've understood um, that Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45 is dealing with uh, the period from 1798 up until uh, basically the end, including the Sunday law. Is that making sense? Because um, I'm trying to get a point here. But but so far, everything I've said, it makes sense, at least, even if it's not complete. The uh, seven heads, would you connect that also with Daniel 7, where you have uh, mm -hmm. the beast with the lion and then the bears, yes. that's two heads, and then you get four heads. Yeah. So the, the, symbol the, of seven is, yeah the symbol of seven is there. And that's where the seven heads comes from. Because if you look at the, the beast of Revelation 7, or, or Daniel's chapter 7, you end up with those seven heads, you know, just by putting together the, the beasts into one. Um, but you can't say that the heads are the same heads in Revelation 13 as the heads in Daniel chapter 7. So the imagery is brought from Daniel chapter 7. But Jan Daniel chapter 7 is is addressing Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. And then in Revelation 13, we see them as a composite beast. So we have a lot of the same symbols, but they're now being applied in a different time period. And so the seven heads have to be something different. Now, it's usually um, these seven heads then, they represent not exactly the same heads in Daniel chapter seven, but we take them as Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, pagan Rome, papal Rome, the United States, and then finally the United Nations as the seventh head. And now we're, we're of course get to that in Revelation chapter 17. But what's being what's happening here is the wounding of one of the heads, which is the fifth head. And then the sixth head is going to be the one that arises as the second beast. So the sixth head of, of Revelation 13 dragon is actually the second beast. Does that make sense to people? Because this is how I've understood it for quite a long time. Um, is there any questions on that? Not at this moment for me. Okay. And, and the reason why I'm bringing this up is we have this, the second beast is the seven, 70 years being the days of one king. This is the United States in Bible prophecy. It arises in 1798. It's the sixth head of this beast 
The fifth head is the one that received the deadly wound. And that would be Tyre if we go back to uh, chapter uh, 26, 27, and 28 of Ezekiel, because Tyre is the one that is going to um, um, I can't remember the words that Isaiah uses regarding it, but it's it's at the end of 70 the thing, years. The thing is the harlot. Yeah, at the end of 70 years, right? I just can't remember how he describes the period during the time. They're going to be forgotten. That's the word. So they're going to be forgotten for 70 years. And so Tyre is a symbol of that. Um, and... Uh, well, it's going to be forgotten, but not necessarily for 70 years, but during that period of 70 years. But at the end of the 70 years, Tyre will sing as a harlot. And so we know that Tyre, um, during the time that Nebuchadnezzar rises, uh, or that the Neo-Babylonian Empire rises with the fall of Assyria, that um, Nebuchadnezzar and his dad before him, uh, they dominate the Middle East. And... And they don't just take over everything on that day. They obviously take time to do it. And Tyre is subjugated by um, Nebuchadnezzar, but he doesn't get anything from it. So he's going to be given Egypt. So we, we have to keep all of these elements in our mind. We have to, this is like a puzzle where we have to hold all these pieces in our mind and put it together in our mind. It's, it's, it's not an easy puzzle because we need to know each of these pieces uh, to see how we're going to apply them. And, and that's why I keep going over them again and again. So we need to know who the players are. We need to know the time frame in which these players are set. And then we need to know when we're interpreting at any particular time, we need to know exactly where we are in prophecy to understand when these particular uh, prophecies apply. So we know the days of one king. There's going to be the end of the United States. And we always mark that as the Sunday law. So the United States, um, because that's when it's going to speak as a dragon. And, and that's when uh, the resurrected papacy comes into play. And it's going to um, the beast that was and is not now is, right? So that power is going to come to play with the United Nations and the United States in that threefold union under the time of the Sunday law. Now we of course have the Sunday law, we take use this term, but it's actually a broader term because we know that there's the Sunday law in the United States. Uh, there's the Sunday's laws as they uh, spread out uh, to the world. And then uh, finally there is uh, the universal Sunday law and the Sunday law with the death decree. So there's a progression of these Sunday laws. And, and I'm not sure if we, we really have a consistent interpretation of how this occurs and how we apply these different prophecies. Uh, because we know in Revelation 13, verse 16, when it says, and he causeth all both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark on their right hand or in their foreheads, uh, that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark of the name of the beast or the number of his name. We know that this this prophecy here, uh, we look at as the Sunday law, but when does that actually occur? We, we say in the United States, it occurs first. Um, but when does it actually become the mark of the beast? And, 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 and I think that's different for different pe groups of people. I would say for Seventh-day Adventists, that that who reject the Sabbath that they're going to receive the mark of the beast first because it, it, it comes with a result of rejecting a light on the Sabbath. For others who, who don't know anything about the Sabbath and maybe at first keep the Sunday, uh, they will have an opportunity to figure this out. And, and so when it's, it's finally complete, I don't know. But there's also lots about this 666 that we we have never really considered, partly because it's been so obscured by the evangelicals. But as we know, in Ezekiel, we have 666 years from the captivity of Jehoiachin to the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. 
And so we know that this symbol 666 is much more involved than uh, just some mark, that it's tying together uh, a number of prophecies, and especially the prophecies of Ezekiel that have to do with this mark and, and Ezekiel chapter 8, specifically, as we know, as Seventh-day Adventists, chapter 8 and 9. Uh, so chapter 8 is apostasy. Chapter 9 is when that mark is, is uh, uh, going to go out. So, so there's lots of things here, lots of pieces of the puzzle. So when we go to chapter 17, and we deal finally with this, as, as we saw in verse 12, these 10 horns which thou sawest are 10 kings. This is the United Nations. Um, so this is this kingdom that we're studying here in Ezekiel, which is Egypt, right? So we, we would say that in this case, we have a woman riding this beast. This woman is the papacy after it has been resurrected. And um, many Adventists just kind of put this over to 1798. Actually, I used to do that for a lot of years. I didn't fully understand um, because when you look at the beginning, it'll talk about uh, he goes into the spirit into the wilderness and he sees a woman sitting upon a scarlet covered beast. And so I would take that symbol of the wilderness and say, well, that must be 1798. Okay, one, yeah. one question. Yeah, okay. Are you saying the woman is resurrected or are you saying the beast is resurrected? Yes, so the beast is resurrected. Okay. That is one of the heads that was wounded unto death. So that's the problem that we have here is we have a symbol in Revelation 13 that has the papacy is just one of the heads of the beast, right? So the okay. papacy is not seen as a woman riding upon the beast in Revelation 13, or 13 right? It's just that's that beast we call papal Rome, right? The, the beast of Revelation 13 is papal Rome. And, and it's called papal Rome because it's, it's, it's showing that that kingdom, that worldwide kingdom, at the time when the deadly wound is given, right? So it's marking a time in the history of this beast, and this beast spans from Babylon to the second coming, right? And we can see that by taking Daniel chapter 7, and we can see that by taking Revelation chapter 12, and Revelation 13, and Revelation 17, that this beast, or these kingdoms of the earth, in their various forms, are still all connected, right? And, and the prophecies of Daniel do that in other ways as well, not just with the beast. So yes, when we see that one of the heads is, is re that received the deadly wound and it becomes healed, when it becomes healed, um, we're gonna have to try to understand what that means. Uh, but we know that this great whore that sitteth upon the beast now, so it, it's, it's, it's shown separate from the beast itself in that it's not just the beast, but it's this woman because the woman is now in control. And all through those other histories, the woman did not have control of the whole world. So this is a church. So the woman is a church. The papacy, of course, has its political elements to it. It's, it's, um, but it, it's always using the powers of the earth it's using the kingdoms of the earth to wield its power. But finally, in Revelation 17, it's in control of the whole world. And that's why the woman is riding the beast. But it is still one of the heads that was wounded. I still believe they're the same heads that are being depicted in Revelation 17 as in Revelation 13. Uh, I don't know if that makes sense, but it's a very good question you asked. Is that a satisfactory answer, or do you have another observation regarding that I'm not noticing? No, I, I, your answer was quite complete. Okay. So the, I mean the 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 direction I was that I was going in when you said resurrected, I was you know, my consideration had been that this woman technically had been hidden. Yeah, and, and, and that's the thing, because when we look at the symbol of Tyre, Tyre then is at the end of the 70 years is going to sing as a harlot, right? So that's the end of the 70 years. When you get to Revelation 17, 
that's tire singing as a harlot. Okay. So the reason I ask about the resurrected beast is so that you could then provide the tie-in with this with 1798 because the woman has been existent throughout history. Right. And, and the wound that it received was not the end of the papacy, well, but it was, it, it was an appear, apparent end of the papacy. You know, one of the problems that, that Uriah Smith had with Ellen White Right. Um, in her understanding of, and that, of that's why the, his end of the book of Daniel is different, Daniel chapter 11, is for an American living in the time that Uriah Smith did, the idea that somehow the papacy was going to rise again was a very difficult point to accept. Um, you know, looking at the situations that existed in his day, there didn't seem any prospect in any time soon that you're going to see the papacy arise. Of course, he didn't realize how much time was going to pass until the end of the world, because they're thinking that Jesus is coming back really, really soon. And he okay. just looked at the events that were happening in Turkey, and he was then trying to apply that as Turkey being the king of the north. Well, it, it, let's let, let's take this in a different in a, in a different manner. Okay. Uriah, Uriah Smith's training, especially when, when he was going through his formative years of schooling, mm -hmm. was not taking sola scriptura. He was applying a lot of things, especially from, from different commentators such as, and I, I may mangle the man's name, Genesius. Jesenius. Jesenius. Okay, thank you. The, the issue is that Smith was valuing Jensenius and his viewpoint above that of many of the others. Mm -hmm. and, and to just let everybody know, uh, Dwight has done a lot of studying um, into Uriah Smith and his history and what Ellen White has said to him, his counsels. And, and that's why he doesn't like when I look at uh, Daniel and Revelation. Uh, not that, you know, you know that Daniel and Revelation has some good in it. There, there, but, but it has a lot of distortion in it as well. And, the, you know, the, the whole point, and I've, I have said this repeatedly, the one thing that I have gleaned from this with the book Daniel and Revelation is it's helped me to reason more clearly from cause to effect after I've done this study on Uriah Smith. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, the the direction that that I'm addressing at this point is that Smith could see the events that were going on within Rome. He mm -hmm. understood that this this Pope Pio Nono, uh, Pius the Ninth, yeah, was giving a series of pronouncements that have laid the groundwork for what we see today as the modern papacy. Yeah. But in his time from, let's say 1863 onward, he was not, a, he was not seeing that the, the healing was beginning to occur on the situation with the papacy. To yes. him, this wound was still in place. Yeah. Yeah. So, but yeah, I mean, he, he sort of sees that the papacy comes into play at the end, sort of almost as an afterthought, just because more as, um, you know, all these other nations have create, created the situ situation for the papacy, papacy to arise. So he looks primarily at, at what's happening in Turkey and so forth. As, as what these prophecies are talking about. So he doesn't discount the papacy totally, but he doesn't see that the papacy is behind the whole thing. Well, the, the other point that I found interesting is that from 1863, when Pius IX was making his, his bigger pronouncements, especially on Mariology, to the time of the Lateran Treaty, 
you have a, a time period of 66 years. So I don't know if, if we could accept 66 years as being a fractal of 666 or if if it's just a another odd coincidence. Yeah. Um, I, I, did, I don't think it's an odd coincidence. Now, the First Vatican Council, what, what are the years of the First Vatican Council? Do you remember? Um, I believe that was in 1872. Yeah. So it, it's, 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 it's in the late 1800s anyway. Right. Um, so, so we have this First Vatican Council and 1870. 1870. Okay, and, and that's the year that 1870 is the year, which is on July 18th, 1870, that the Pope um, declares himself as infallible. I, I'll correct myself. According to, according to what I'm looking at right now, the First Vatican Council, uh, the convocation was given on 29th of June of 1868. And the planning for it began on the 6th of December of, the, of 1864. Um, the, this, the 20th Ecumenical Council of the Catholic Church, held three centuries after the Council of Trent, opened on 8th of December of 1869 and adjourned on the 20th of October of 1870. Okay, so the first Vatican Council. Yeah, so you just are you getting that from Wikipedia? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So yeah, so um I know people won't be able to see it on the screen, even though I have it there, it's too tiny. Uh yeah, so it opened December 8th, 1869, and adjourned October 20th, 1870. So that declaration of the Pope, which is on July 18th, 1870, regarding the infallibility of the Pope, uh, that's during the First Vatican Council. Now, now what's, what's intriguing to me when, when this was being addressed from what I was reading here on uh, the First Vatican Council, that this Pope, defined the dogma of the Immaculate Conception on December 8th of 1854. Yeah. But on December 8th, 1864, in his published encyclical, Quanta Cura, How Much Care, to this was attached his famous syllabus of errors, which were attempts to identify God with the world or to exclude God from it and the relationship between faith and reason. Mm -hmm. So when he convened the First Vatican Council from 1869 to 1870, uh, it contained a dogmatic constitution, pastor eternus, from the Latin eternal pastor. Now that I'm not getting from Wikipedia, I'm getting it from a book by Richard P. McBrien called The Lives of the Pope that was published during the uh, pontificate of um, John Paul II. Okay. Yeah, so one thing we can, we can say here, that because we, we kind of drifted a little bit, uh, but we want to get this really clear, is we need to know the players involved here. So right. the players are the United States, the papacy, and the UN. Now, in, in order for, um, so one of the ways that I used to look at the threefold union, I mean, I didn't really call it the UN, I just called it spiritualism. And I was, uh, it was Roy Allen, at, Roy Anderson, whatever his middle name was. Um, I'd read when I was an early Adventist, I'd read his book, Commentary and Revelation. I don't know if you're familiar with it. Um, but in there, you know, he had a very different view regarding um, Revelation 17, which 
which came, became kind of the main Adventist view for a long time. Roy, Roy Allen Anderson. That's see. correct. Okay. And um, it never really got corrected in my mind completely until I got into this movement. And, and in particular was his views on Revelation 17, because he would look at uh, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. He would look at the dragon power, even though there's some truth to it, but he would look at it as communism. And, and so there, there is a truth to that. Um, but when, we, when the Soviet Union fell, see, this is the problem that, that, of course, he wrote this before the fall of the Soviet Union. But when the Soviet Union fell, it was the writings of Louis F. Weir that began to correct my understanding of this. Because with the fall of the Soviet Union, I, I didn't really understand what that meant. And, um, and I'm not sure if that we even fully understand completely what that meant. Um, but we know now that Russia is the king of the South but Russia is not atheistic communism any longer. And one of the criticisms people have had in this movement regarding our view is that when, when we started to understand Daniel chapter 11, that Russia is the head and Russia had to be, uh, the, the head, it, it only came up to the neck in 1989. Many people actually left this movement over that issue. Um, they, they really didn't like the idea that Russia has any part to play in, in understanding of, of the events of the King of the North and the King of the South. And, and that was sort of, you know, Mark Bruce's group that was really opposed to that. You know, other issues were there, but that was one of their issues. So as we're, as we're approaching these events that, you know, we're in the middle of these events dealing with the American election, and we had predicted Rafi and Panim as being these battles between the King of the North and the King of the South. And they did not pan out in the way that we expected. We expect them to happen in the future. Um, we still have to sort through a bunch of things uh, regarding the beginning of Daniel chapter 11 and even all the way through Daniel chapter 11. We've done studies on it. And um, what I expect to see is that many people in this movement are going to start to dismantle um, our understanding of Daniel chapter 11 that came uh, in 2015, in, in the end of 2015, right? Um, which was first just the understanding of Trump, right? Trump being Xerxes. Um, so, so, so we have to get this sorted out. If we're going to have a correct understanding, if we're going to to address what's going to be happening in this movement as far as, as you say, we're gonna be examining Daniel chapter 11 again. And, and I know some people who definitely will dismantle our understanding of Daniel chapter 11, or at least will attempt to in the minds of, of many. So I think this is a really pertinent point right now to address what's in Ezekiel and what's in Revelation and what's in Daniel chapter 11. Okay. You got a comment there? Yeah, I, I've got, I have two comments quick. Um, okay. Roy Allen Anderson yeah. was one of the three parties that helped to create the abomination known as Questions on Doctrine. Right, yeah. Second, you were saying Trump as Xerxes, not Artaxerxes. I'm, I'm just... Trying to make that Xerxes, Xerxes. Yeah, Trump is Xerxes in in Daniel chapter, right? Because that's the the one that's the rich one, right? Okay. Um, right. So that's Xerxes. That's the Xerxes of the book of Esther, which is called Ahasuerus in the King okay. James. Okay. Right. So well, the point was in chapter two, when the fourth shall be far richer than they all, and by his strength. Through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Grisha. That is Trump. And, yeah. And, and so I'm not sure. I know that there are people who are going to reject that view that that's Trump. Um, and I've already seen uh, the workings of that in the minds of 
certain individuals within this movement. So they're going to reject our interpretation of Daniel chapter 11, these parts as a repeat of history. So you're going to see a battle over this. Um, but then we have a mighty king shall stand up. Now, we've taken that to be Trump as well in charge of the UN. And, and, and we're still holding to that position, you know, until we see otherwise. So I'm not saying that we're totally correct on our view or our understanding of these things. We may be corrected, but some people will just totally dismantle it. They will so, just say the whole idea was wrong. So I, I, I'm not disagreeing on 11-2. On I do see this as Trump. I, yeah. that, that's one I think it could be easily defended. Yeah. The, the 11 3, I'm, I'm just going from, from the verbiage and from the way that that's written, that this is an additional king, but a mighty king. Well, well it's Alexander the Great. I, I understand that. Yeah. But Alexander the Great was very different from Ahasuerus. Exactly. So Ahasuerus is a symbol of, you know, in the book of Esther, as a good king. Right. Uh, Alexander is a bad king. Right. And, and his symbol is actually very similar to the papacy. He's in some ways typifying the papacy. Well, the way that, the way that I had been looking at this and the questions I had been putting together was, is this also not an, examine, or an example of the intelligentsia that believe that they are so much more intelligent even than God? Yeah, it's just when we have a, something like a mighty king, we know it's Alexander the Great, historically, right. but you would have to say that there's definitely a parallel between uh, the little horn power, um, even though this, is, this is, is Greece, it's not Rome, but there's definitely a parallel. Now, part of it is you can go back to Daniel chapter 8. So most people have never really studied Daniel chapter 8, the first part. We always really skip that. But we did go through it. And one of the things we saw about Daniel chapter 8 is there's this progression of Gadol, right? That is right. self-exaltation that occurs. Right. And, and obviously, when you get to uh, the ram and, and, the, and this goat that comes against it. So this goat is Greece. And that, that great horn is, is Alexander, right? And then it's broken, goes towards the four twin... Uh, um, for winds of heaven, and then you have come out of them a little horn, and he waxed exceeding great, right? So you have this progression of Gadol. You have a great, a very great, and exceeding great. Um, so it's progressive. Right. But all of those are symbols of this, this particular power that becomes manifest in the Pope, because that's really what it's about, because the Pope is a manifestation of satanic power. It's the spirit of Satan and that all that self-exaltation that existing in these kingdoms are really that same satanic power, that pride of power that we've been talking about, that, that is being exalted. So um, when you get to this, a mighty king, obviously we can see that it's Alexander the Great, but if we're trying to apply it to our time, if you look at the role that Trump plays, stirring up everything against the globalists, I've always had a hard time with saying then that the mighty king that stands up is still Trump. Right. Yeah. Now, now, and I talked with Jeff about this on two occasions that I can think of. And on both occasions, he made arguments for why he believes it's the UN. One was a private conversation, just me talking to him. The other one was actually in a class um, um, that I brought it up. And he, he said basically the same thing. And that's why I think I talked to him later about it. Um, but he shall rule with great dominion do according to his will. This doing according to his will aspect is often a, a symbol of the papacy. Okay. Right. But then when we see, you know, but obviously we know that this is Greece and, and then we can see it's universal nature because it's going to be scattered when its horn is broken towards the four winds of heaven. Right. And, and then we, we take this and we now start to apply this again. We go through these verses 
and we look at a repeat of history. So Daniel chapter 11 keeps repeating the same history and giving us more details. Right. And, and so I'm not so sure that we're correct about our interpretation of, of Alexander symbolizing Trump. He symbolizes something that comes after Trump. Why, and, I, I'm, a, I'm more of the opinion that this is a separate king, not Trump. Right. Now, on the world stage right now, the only, the only other party that could be considered a mighty king would be Putin. It's definitely not going to be Biden because, I mean, this is a guy that's one blood clot away from a stroke. Yeah. And he won't be around for very long. No, he's, he's definitely not going to be around for very long. Yeah. yeah. And I don't think he's suffering from dementia. I think he's just suffering from uh, trans ischemic attacks. Okay. You know, which is little tiny blood clots. Because uh, I've seen that. I've known people with that, with that happening to them. And, and that's what you, you see in his behavior. It's not Alzheimer's or some kind of dementia like that. It's just simply he has really many strokes. They don't affect him to the point that they cause paralysis or anything. Uh, they just affect uh, mental function. But, but anyway, how, how that's my, my, my medical opinion. <laughs> okay. All right. How many how many of those could a person have before they become mentally incapacitated? Well, they can have tons of them because they're very tiny. They can be very tiny, just very tiny little blood clots that you know do slow damage to the brain. They affect the memory more than anything. Right. But they, they're not like dementia where they're always there and they're always affecting you. Um, you know, so, but anyway, yeah, I mean, and I could be completely wrong, but definitely he's, he's not, he's not the same person he was 20 years ago. He was as sharp as attack 20 years ago. Uh, well, he, you, you kind of have to be sharp as attack if you're, if you're going to sit here and plagiarize. Him. Yeah. He's a smart guy, but he, he's definitely declined. But yeah, I don't, you know, but we don't know that he's even going to still win. I mean, right. I, I'm assuming that that Trump will end up winning these court cases and, uh, and we will descend into some kind of civil war. But but be that as it may, because we don't know the future. Right. Just studying the Bible and we're trying to understand it. And uh, we're not prophets. Right. We, we just have God's word and, and we have God's leading. And, and as things are fulfilled, we come to understand more and more clearly God's word. But uh, the point is now we're getting back to Ezekiel. So I, I have a whole bunch that we need right. to look at in Ezekiel chapter 30. But I want you to hold these other things in your mind. So this, this war that's being talked about, this um, uh, uh, that's talk, talked about in chapter 30, verse 20 to 26, is actually, I believe... Uh, uh, Pharaoh Hophra, Hophra. Um, and this is in Jeremiah 37. So let's go there. So this is the time in which we're, we're referring to this. So this is in the reign of Zedekiah. And it says, In King Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, reigned instead of Kaniah, the son of Jehoiachim. So Kaniah is Jehoiachin, um, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, made king in the land of Judah. But neither he nor his servants nor the people of the land did hearken unto the words of the Lord, which he spake by the prophet Jeremiah. So this, during the time of Zedekiah, Jeremiah is prophesying. And Zedekiah, the king of Jehuchal, the son of Sh Shelemiah, and Zephaniah, the son of Messiah, the priest of the prophet Jeremiah, said, Pray now unto the Lord our God for us. Um, so, so Zedekiah is seeking uh, these prophets. Um, the, which, you know, I'm not sure much, I don't know much about these different people. Uh, um, but anyway, so he's talking to these people and they go to Jeremiah. So Zedekiah is seeking message from Jeremiah. Now Jeremiah came in and went out among the people for he had 
not put him in prison. So this is talking about a period of time. Um, and, and I'm not sure exactly how to deal with this, but one of the things we do know historically is the next verse. Then Pharaoh's army was come forth out of Egypt when the Chaldeans that besieged Jerusalem heard tidings of them, they part departed from Jerusalem. Um, now, in trying to understand this verse here, Pharaoh's army was come forth out of Egypt, but when the Chaldeans that besieged Jerusalem heard tidings of them, they departed from Jerusalem. Um, so the question is, who is being talked about here in this sentence? It's sometimes very awkward uh, to read sentences. So um, I'm going to look at one of these commentaries on how he parses this out. Uh, this is a keel and um, he's the commentator from the keel and Dillich commentary. Uh, the account of what befell Jeremiah and what he did during the last siege of Jerusalem by the Chaldeans until the taking of the city with the general remark that Zedekiah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had made king in the land of Judah in place of Keniah, on which to... Um, when he became king, did not listen to the words of the Lord through Jeremiah, neither himself nor his servants, nor the people of the land, or the population of Judah. Then follows Jeremiah 37, 3 to 10, a declaration of the prophet regarding the issue of the siege, which he sent to the king by the messengers who were to beseech him for his intercession with the Lord. The occasion of this declaration was, a, was the following. Zedekiah sent to Jeremiah two of his chief officers, um, with this charge, pray now for us to Jehovah our God. This message was sent to Jeremiah while he was still went in and out among the people and had not yet been put in prison. So there's other chapters we could look at dealing with that. And he always has all these references to Hebrew and stuff that we're not going to look at. Both these circumstances are mentioned for the purpose of giving a clear view of the state of things. Jeremiah's freedom to go in and out, not to prepare us for his imprisonment afterwards but to explain the reason why he sent two chief officers of the realm to him, whereas after his imprisonment, he caused him to be brought. Okay, um, so there's not, so we need to look at um, verse, here, there's where we need to go. Um, he says here, regarding these other ones, in order to cut off every hope, the prophet announces that the Egyptians will bring no help so he takes the position that the Egyptians are coming to help Jerusalem when Pharaoh's army has besieged it, um, but withdraw to their own land before the Chaldeans who went out to meet them without having accomplished their object. But when the Chaldeans will return, continue the siege, take the city and burn it. To assure them of this, he adds, you must not deceive yourselves with the vain hope that the Chaldeans may possibly be defeated and driven back by the Egyptians. Uh, okay. The destruction. So anyway, the point that I'm trying to make here is when we get back to Ezekiel chapter 30, that what's happening here, this vision is given in the context of, of, of this, that Egypt is going to come to the rescue of the Jews, but then turns back once the Chaldeans come against them. No, you didn't. Didn't we cover this before in Ezekiel 17? Um, in Ezekiel 17, yes, we did deal with, um, we dealt partly with this. Ezekiel 17, 15 is what I'm thinking of. Yeah. He, but he rebelled, right, because he calls these ambassador, ambassadors from Egypt that they might give him horses and much people, right? So we know that he was looking to Egypt to deliver him from Babylon, right? But this particular aspect of it, uh, of the timing of, of this, is that this is happening um, in between. Um, here, let me see here. One of these other commentators. If we, if we okay, but if we if we look at another scripture, Second Kings twenty four seven. Okay. Let's go there. And the king of Egypt came not again anymore out of the land, for the king of Babylon had taken 
from the river of Egypt unto the river Euphrates, all that pertain to the king of Egypt. So this is under Jehoiakim. So this is just referring to the time, or, or pardon me, of Jehoiakim dies, Jehoiachin reigns. Right. Right. So this is just talking about that period of time. So this is earlier. So this is like 11 years later that Egypt comes again. Okay, but the, I guess the point that I'm trying to get at from Scripture Babylon had already taken pretty fair control. You've just established that this was taken, this control was established about 11 years prior to what we're looking at in Ezekiel 30. Yeah. So the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, is besieging Jerusalem. And the king of Egypt decides, well, I'm going to go up and I'm going to see if we can't relieve that siege. Right. So Babylon... Nebuchadnezzar makes the decision that you, if you're going to try to come against me again, I'm going to show you your fault. So I'm going to pull up from my siege of Jerusalem and we're going to come battle you. Yeah. So from scripture, we can see that there is that, that this has already been an established situation that Babylon is already in control and right that Egypt is a usurper to that control. Exactly. Okay. And um, so the point, I think you, you've cleared up the, you know, the issue because I'm trying to get people to understand what's happening here. Right. Um, and this is happening um, because it's three months after the prophecy of Ezekiel 21, verse 9. And it's three months before. And um, so this, this defeat has happened somewhere uh, between these two dates. So it's near the end of the siege that Egypt is going to come and try to help um, you know, Zedekiah. But, but Babylon scares them off so i don't know how we would then apply this in our time so that's part of the thing like i really wanted to establish or i want to establish you know what's happening here so we have egypt we have judah and we have babylon so babylon in this context we say is symbolizing the united states and judah is symbolizing the Seventh-day Adventist church. And Egypt is representing the United Nations. So how would we make an application of this? <clears throat> okay. Babylon is in control. Egypt is trying to come up to usurp this, but is, is beaten back. And, and, and if Judah is the church, the church is looking to Egypt. Right. Which is the world. Okay. Does so, that describe Seventh-day Adventists in any way? In too many ways, it describes Seventh-day Adventists. Okay. But then how would, we, how would we understand um, Babylon coming against the world? Where would we, we place that? Because we just studied Daniel chapter 11, uh, verse you know, 1 to 4, and verse 2 addresses that point, I think. Because Babylon is here symbolizing, symbolizing the United States. And the United okay. States is, is fighting against the globalist. And is the, is the church looking to the globalist to deliver them from the United States? That's the question. Can we make that application? I'm not saying I am. I'm saying, can we do that? I'm not seeing that we can make that application, but I'd have, I'd have to give that further consideration. Yeah. I mean, it's just a new idea and trying to understand how we understood these symbols. Now, we also understand that Nebuchadnezzar at the end of the world 
in this context, if we take what's happening with Ezekiel, he does also symbolize the deliverance from Christ. So Christ delivering us from Egypt. But here's, here's my problem. So here's the, th the things that, that, that as I've studied since 2018, um, when somebody tells me that I can't, uh, that I have to listen to CNN, and that's the source of truth, well, I'm going to start to do a thorough examination of the news media and try to find out who's telling the truth, if any of them. And one thing's clear is that all of the media, whether it's Fox or CNN, they're not on the side of truth. There might be individuals in, in all those medias who are objective people, but the media by itself uh, distorts reality. It, it, it can't help but do so. Um, and it's also driven by dollars, right? So it's driven by profit. It's not driven by some altruistic um, idea of wanting to know what the truth is. And when I started to examine a lot of these claims that were being made by Tess, I found that they were, were false. That is, CNN has no interest in truth whatsoever. And um, that the things that were being said about Trump, the Steele dossier, that's a conspiracy theory. Um, Cambridge Analytica is another conspiracy theory. They had nothing to do with Trump's victory in the election. Um, um, you know, all these different things that were being taught to this movement, I found to be false. But I also found that in spite of Trump's flaws, and this is just my, my opinion, uh, I believe that he actually thinks he's doing good. And, and in some ways is that he's holding off the globalists. And the ones that we really need to fear are the globalists, which is something that as Seventh-day Adventists, we have always understood, where Parminder and Tess told us that that's a conspiracy theory. You know, the idea that the Jesuits and the globalists and all these things, all these groups are seeking to, to take over the world, the idea of a one world government. Parminder dismissed that all as conspiracy theories. Uh, but I think Parminder was wrong. And I, I think it's pretty clear that the kingdoms of this world are seeking to unite together and that the Pope is primarily behind that. And that Trump coming in, he actually stands against that, that those goals. Right. So, so that, that puts to me a different interpretation upon what Parminder and, and others have, have tried to say about end time events. And, and I'm not sure where I completely stand on what's gonna happen with Trump, but I can say at this point, uh, Trump doesn't look like a bad king. And, and so we have some interpretations where we make him Tiberius, uh, this vile person, which definitely he is. But I think that when you start to look at to the end of what happens with uh, Rome, that uh, we, we could probably have a different interpretation of Roman history than we have. Well, there, <clears throat> there, there's quite a bit more as we, as we look to progress through that portion of Daniel, because I, I don't see Trump entering into some kind of relationship or agreement with the daughter of the king of the south. Yeah. But I'm having to ask the question if the daughter of the king of the south may not be a representation of Biden's running mate. Yeah, I don't know. See, see, I have an interpretation. I've told people I didn't really want to say anything until I knew that Trump is actually lost because I still think Trump is going to win. But, right. but I see a scenario that if Trump loses, that he is really the last king of the United States. He is the last president. That we can't look at, at Biden and Kamala Harris as doing anything other than to give the United States over to the globalists, right. which Trump has fought against. 
Exactly. So, but, but I, yeah. then if I, I don't like case, predicting the future. What's that? If that was the case, would there not have to be a Sunday law because national apostasy is followed by national ruin? So right. we've connected the end of the United States, the national room with the Sunday law. Right. So there would have to be a Sunday law coming in, but not necessarily with Trump. Because one of the things about the, the study of the, the, the 19th um, president and the 20th president dealing with Judah and Israel is that we, we recognize that Trump is the 19th, um, did I do that right? Or is he the 20th? I always get the, no, he's the 19th because he represents Northern Israel and he's the 19th Republican president, correct? Okay. Yeah. And, and Ted Wilson is the 20th um, uh, of the general Adventist gen president of the General Conference. And so we have the 19th and the 20th. And this happens with the fall of Jerusalem. At the time of the fall of Jerusalem, right? So, not at the time, but that's by the time of the fall of Jerusalem, is the nineteenth king. Zedekiah is the nineteenth king, and um, am I doing that right, or am I doing it wrong? I'm doing it. He's the twentieth. Twentieth, yeah. I always keep getting the mix written around in my head. So, the nineteenth represents northern Israel, and that Trump, and that represent represents the Republican president but judah is the seventh day adventist church and that represents zedekiah parallels with ted wilson so we have ted wilson whose a presidency was extended because of the pandemic because he could have been voted out and we now have trump who is still the 19th republican president and i don't you know i don't have an answer to that I mean, until we see things unfold, I don't think that I can fully comprehend what's going to happen because we don't know what's going to happen. Trump very well could uh, be the king in the midst of a civil, civil war. We could, we, we could have a civil war. We could have the Sunday law and all these things. And Biden and Kamala Harris, they may never become a president and vice president. We don't know. So... But what I think that we should at least understand is that there are different ways to interpret these passages in Daniel chapter 11. And, and when I look at Ezekiel chapter uh, 29, 30, 31, 32, as we keep going through these, I think that this is telling us something about the situation that we haven't seen before. That is, there's more detail regarding these events than we we saw in the past. And, and part of it is you cannot see things until prophecy is fulfilled and you pass over the ground of fulfilled prophecy. You're not going to see these things clearly. And my view is as we go through this, this, we thought July 18th was a crisis. I really believe that this issue of the election is going to be a greater divisive crisis for this movement unless we can go to the upper room. And, and, and be converted, right? We have to somehow figure out how we're gonna to press together and, and come to understand these things correctly. And, and I don't think that the movement is over yet. Um, the role of FFA, as far as being Samuel Snow's letters, the PBM, that role is over. So there was this increase of light that came in a specific way, but we still have a work to do and and I think that we have to pull together in order to accomplish that work. But that's a little bit scattered. You know, we've we've gone all over the place here. But are we starting to get a picture of the of what what's at play in studying Ezekiel chapter is dealing with Egypt? Are people getting a better understanding of it? It's putting a lot of pieces on the board. Yeah, and and exactly how it all fits together. I think we're going to have to wait to some degree. Um, you know, Colin here in uh, Alberta, you know, he really thinks that, that Trump's going to take over. To him, he's 100% he's certain and that this is going to be something that uh, leads to um, a recognition of this movement. And, 
and I would say definitely if that happens, um, it could it could definitely help. The one problem I have is that the omega, they see exactly that same thing that they're they're counting on Trump becoming a dictator because he's bad, and if he doesn't, and and Biden wins, I don't know what the new movement is going to do if they have Biden. And Kamala, I mean, obviously they're going to come up with some way of interpreting it, but they're going to see this as good. I mean, they love the Democrats and everything they stand for. So I, I don't know where the new movement stands on what's happening. I would think they would be under the position that Trump is still going to take power. So, you know, so the fact that they think that it doesn't mean it's true or wrong. Uh, but definitely it would be a vindication of their position even more than a vindication of our position. Well, so like you, like you, I have not followed anything that they really have to say. No, no, I do know though that at least till recently they have been doing presentations showing that Trump's going to become a dictator. So, uh, and, and I haven't looked at, at anything they've done since the election, though I know they are doing videos because I always get the notifications, um, but I, I rarely ever look at them. Like, and if I do, I can hardly more than stomach two minutes, but I'll sometimes read through the, um, the transcript and just kind of see where they're, they're headed. But, uh, but yeah, it's, it, all I know is right now, a lot of things are up in the air, but what we have to figure out is what those pieces are and how they're gonna to fit together. Because as, as things unfold, um, we're gonna have, you know, we're gonna have a crisis in this movement one way or the other. And it's, and it's not gonna be about July 18, 2020. It's gonna be over Daniel chapter 11. So. <clears throat> But the, I, think, I think the main point that you're also trying to get at is all of this with Ezekiel is giving us other pieces that are going to play into this with the interpretation of Daniel 11, just right. like the points that you were making out of Jeremiah. Yeah, yeah, because we, we Ezekiel, remember Ezekiel is this movement, right? This is the priests. And, and in order for the priest to have this message, and, and we've seen this, um, you know, at the end of chapter 29, for instance, where we just have this um, out of place verse, as you say, in that day, I will cause the horn of the house of Israel to bud forth, and I will give thee the opening of the mouth in the midst of them, right? So that means that, that in this time, that this time that we're in, we're going to have a message. And this, this is the house of David, right? And you, you made it clear that we're the house of David, that we're David um, as well. He's typifying this movement at the end of the world and, and God's people at the end of the world. Um, so that this opening of the mouth to give this message is, is tied into all of this stuff dealing with Egypt, with Tyre, all these symbols, which is about the issues at the end of the world. And if you go back to... Um, the time of the end magazine you know one of the things that we see that jeff has laid out is the threefold union and that's one of the things that the new movement has denied that is they will look at egypt the world as the good one and united and the united states as the bad one which which really makes no sense and especially with trump as the head so yeah i'm not sure what their interpretations are but I just know within this movement, we, we do, as you pointed out, we have all of this light coming from Ezekiel and we need to understand it if we're going to understand Daniel chapter 11 and the time that we're in. Exactly. So, um, now, we're, we're going to look at, uh, you know, chapter 31 tomorrow, we, you know, and we're probably going to finish up chapter 30 a bit. But both 31 and 32 are going to have these dates attached with them. And, um, and, and where we place them, um, 
in, in these chronologies, in these lines, um, are extremely important. And, um, and there are some discrepancies here, or, or choices, I guess, not discrepancies, but choices I have uh, for placing 32, where do I place it? Um, and of course, I, I have a way I place it. Uh, but then um, the Pharaoh being slain, uh, the fowls of the heavens, we're again going to see a lot of symbolism that we actually saw with Tyre. Uh, we're going to see the same symbolism in, in the, the destruction of Egypt as well. And so anyway, there's just so much that we have to sort through. And I, and I wish everybody was studying through Ezekiel right now. Um, but, you know, I can't make people do it. But I, I think it's definitely going to help us. And, it, and if we can have this understanding and we can present it clearly uh, as we go into the studies of Daniel, um, then maybe it will help keep us on track. So any final comments? None for me at this point. Okay. Okay, well, let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, uh, we thank you uh, for the time that we had to study again. And we pray for this movement and the plans that are being made to uh, go over Daniel chapter 11. We know, Lord, that uh, it's going to take us time, but we have very little time as events are unfolding around us uh, to make a decision for you. And to be faithful, we just ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit can convict us of our sins, that we can be corrected in any errors we hold to, and that we can have our feet set upon the path, and that the light for the midnight cry will guide us. Be with each person, and thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.